to what can be done in the future. This panel is going to look more to that future piece of things. And I, I thought about this panel and divided it up into kind of two broad categories. And the first one is things have certainly changed around here. Um, looking at what the differences are today uh, compared to 20 years ago, and sometimes what those similarities are, but do we need new policies uh, to address those changes? And then the second piece of it gets to that, which is the where we're going, we don't need roads. Um, so leaning heavily into that back to the future theme. I want to thank our panelists today for joining us. Uh, we have Anna Gomez, who's a partner at Wiley Ryan. Uh, we have Derek Corbin, who is uh, at NDIA. And we have Matthew Pearl, who's at the FCC. And if you all would, wouldn't mind taking a couple minutes to introduce yourselves and talk a bit about what brought you here today and 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 what it is about um, spectrum policy that you're looking forward to in the future. So I'm Anna Gomez. Um, I'm at the law firm of Wiley Ryan. It's so good to see so many faces. Uh, um, my, uh, I, I've been doing uh, spectrum work uh, at in the telecom media technology group at Wiley now for a long time. Uh, prior to that, I was at NTIA. Deputy Administrator. Uh, I also had a past life for 12 years at the FCC, which culminated at the International Bureau, uh, where I did a lot of work with a lot of people that are here. Uh, so my interest in Spectrum, I'm very, very interested in the uh, interagency uh, processes and dynamics, having both done the NTIA side and the FCC side. Um, so I always jump at a chance to be able to talk about those things. Hi, I'm uh, Derek Clopin, and I uh, am with NTIA, as mentioned, since about 2015, primarily in NTIA's front office. Uh, just about six weeks ago, I, I joined the Office of Spectrum Management as a, a deputy associate administrator, one of the deputies there. Thank you, Anna. Um, continuing a lot with the same portfolio. This, this is a this is a great event, and I, I really, you know, uh, you know, thank you, thank you, Kay, for putting this on, and um, it's. I think as we go through this, it'll, it'll be really fascinating. In my, in my background, by the way, 2015 with NTIA before that, a lot of time in the private sector with Nokia, uh, TIA, and I actually started at the commission, but I had that last before this report came out. Um, but but this, I think it's gonna be a great discussion. I, I do want to put a little disclaimer up front, I think, because this is pretty wonky and wide ranging that I think everything we talk about I say may not necessarily reflect all the views of NTIA or the administration, so just want to put that out there sort of thinking of this as a, as a fun conversation on a lot of topics, thanks. Um, hi, hi, Matt Pearl. Um, I uh, echo the disclaimer from Derek, but um, I'm an Associate Bureau Chief uh, in the Wireless Bureau at the FCC. Um, I've been at the Commission for almost 10 years. Um, I never expected to do this that long, but um, you know what brings me to Spectrum Policy it goes back to something that Ruth was saying about value creation. Um, and each band that we're looking at being this unique problem where we need to align technical rules, licensing rules, auction design, legal authority, economic, like all these different issues we need to align to achieve that value creation. Um, and so it, it just never um, ceases to fascinate me. Thank you all. Um, the last panel talked a bit about what the policy landscape looked like back in 2002 when the original Spectrum Task Force report was written. Uh, I'm curious to know what you all see as the Spectrum policy landscape today. Uh, who are the stakeholders? What are the major issues? Basically, let's set the scene for where we are today in 2022. So, so I think on the public side, um, not much has changed in the sense that, you know, in the government, it's the White House, Congress, Commerce and NTIA, um, FCC, um, as well as the agencies that manage Spectrum. Um, although the federal side has become much more important, I think one of the things that I realized as I look back at the report is the CSEA hadn't been passed yet. In other words, you know, there wasn't really a, a good statutory mechanism at that point for um, uh, re reallocating federal spectrum. Um, I, I do think on the non-federal, on the outside of government side, 
um, the stakeholders have changed. I think, like, first and foremost, of course, is just this is a broad and diverse country, um, and everyone in it now completely relies on um, wireless networks, not only for voice service, but for everything. Um, and then you have all kinds of other stakeholders, some of which are new and some of which have changed. Um, so you have um, public interest organizations like PK, you have carriers, um, including nationwide um, or smaller rural carriers. Um, you have um, fixed wireless operators that um, include both sort of the traditional entities that do sort of public safety links and that sort of thing, as well as newer entrants that are providing uh, broadband services to consumers. Um, you have satellite operators, um, including the GSOs that you had um, back in 2002, but um, a lot more NGSOs. Um, and then you have, um, uh, uh, I would also note, um, spectrum coordinators, um, which is both the same and has changed in the sense that you have the traditional um, spectrum coordination coordinators you would have for registration systems, but you also have more dynamic coordinators um, in CBRS. So I think Matt really covered a lot of the landscape there. I mean, I, I kind of view this question as who are the stakeholders? Uh, frankly, it's everybody, and I, and I mean that in terms of U.S. consumers, you know, the economy. Um, we talked already today about how much wireless touches everybody, and you know, to shed a little more light on, I, I think some of the civic uses and the federal missions that are, I think, sometimes uh, often you know mis misunderstood or, or maybe not, not given the. Uh, you know, the consideration because we've talked a lot about federal spectrum use and um, you know re spectrum repurposing and whatnot but I think what's also come to light for folks is the importance of, uh, of federal use and uh, you know obviously people think of the Department of Defense and national security but there's a whole heck of a lot more and you know you, you, we see the disputes that come up but but again part of this is because you look around the world I think some of our our government uses uh, just like on the commercial side, lead the world, right? I mean, we want the strongest defense. We want the safest national airspace. And if we think about things like climate change and weather monitoring and, and NOAA satellites, I mean, I'd put that up against anybody in the world too. So these are all really important considerations that I think, uh, I know we'll get into more on, on national strategies, but sort of bringing all these things together on how we look at spectrum use, um, to me, that's why you have this, you know, you have the stakeholders. The stakeholders is a really big tent and uh, that's why it's really hard to get a lot done. It's really hard to come up with that national vision and strategy because there are a lot of folks who need to be at the table. Yeah, I agree with everything that Matt said. Um, I would also add um, users. Uh, so it's not just the licensees, but the users. This is something that we've seen recently in the C-band challenges. Um, and um, uh, incumbents, adjacent incumbents and non-adjacent incumbents who may be affected by decisions. Uh, so I think that hits everybody. And of course, Congress in its own way because they get involved uh, according to whatever interest their committees may have. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I agree with you. The stakeholders are very broad and broadening. And in terms of the policy landscape, a big difference between now and when the Spectrum Policy Task Force issued its report um, is the proliferation of technologies and connected everything has really, I, I feel like it's um, accelerated the, the, the changes, the need for spectrum, looking at higher bands, uh, all of this evolution of technology um, has added to our spectrum challenges. The other major thing that has happened in the last couple of years is the pandemic. And so I'm curious, to um, ask you about how the pandemic has influenced our understanding of wireless policy. Um, it definitely put to the test our reliance on wireless and Wi-Fi and broadband um, in order to survive and continue throughout the pandemic and also raised more awareness of, about the inequities within that. But how has that, how has the pandemic taught us um, about some of the challenges that need to be addressed as we look to the next 20 years. I absolutely agree. Um, the, the pandemic brought to light, it existed before, it just was exacerbated 
um, the inequity in access to broadband, uh, particularly for certain communities, um, for um, uh, for the poor, um, and and it made it very difficult when we all had to work from home and had children also be at school. You can't have multiple device uh, devices connecting um, to a single mobile device. You just can't have school and work. Um, so I think I, I completely agree with Kathleen that mobile devices are really important and they've revolutionized our uh, ability to access communications. But when it comes to the ability to utilize broadband, um, it, you do need more than a mobile device. It really did bring to light the need for faster, higher capacity broadband speeds um, that, are, that are provided in a variety of technologies, but, uh, it, it, but the, the, the focus on, or the over-reliance on mobile by certain of, uh, of the communities um, made it clear that they need more, they need access to devices, they need funding to be able to access higher speed broadband. Um, and I was very happy to see that in fact Congress uh, is now funding a lot of that. I hope that becomes uh, permanent. Um, so, so I would echo everything that Anna said. Um, I, I think from the FCC wireless perspective, one of the things that we saw is that we facilitated um, in, in cooperation with licensees um, an expansion of our experimental and STA program um, where you had a, because of the extraordinary circumstances of the pandemic, you had a lot more willingness among incumbents to um, work with others um, that were providing access um, to allow them to operate in, in spectrum that was licensed to the incumbent. Um, and, you know, I think that was great during the pandemic, but I think that that's sort of bringing greater coordination and creativity um, to, to spectrum sharing is something that we need to facilitate in a longer term way um, uh, now that hopefully the pandemic is, uh, 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 you know, transitioning away. Yeah, not, not much to add, just to what Matt's point on, on those examples, some of those SDAs were coordinated with NTIA, and I, I think we, you know, we were really proud to be able to, to act quickly there. And, uh, um, I, you know, I, I, I'm hopeful too, it's something we can, we can build on because we certainly are gonna face other, other emergency situations, but also just as a better way of doing business and, and being flexible and nimble, and I think we're gonna see more and more of, of the need to, to act that way, which is not always easy for government. Do you uh, see that change with the SDAs and the, uh, the incumbents working together with uh, other providers to share spectrum as an opening to kind of change that stakeholder dynamic of the zero sum game of, oh, we must hold on to our spectrum and not share it to this kind of all, all tides are rising tides when it comes to having that greater access to spectrum and, sharing ways that make sense? Or is it just a one-time pandemic-only situation that we can expect to kind of go back to the zero-sum game of, of that stakeholder dynamic? Um, well, I, I certainly hope that it's permanent. Um, and, I, and I do think for some incumbents that it was a bit of a change in their mindset. Um, but, but I also think that it's something that we need to do outreach and explain some of the benefits um, if you look at sort of existing shared bands like CBRS, one of the one of the benefits that isn't talked about enough is that you have traditional licensees that are benefiting from the economies of scale of the unlicensed community because you have the GAA that's operating, you know, without having to purchase the option spectrum, and it's vice versa where the traditional unlicensed operators are benefiting from the economies of scale of the priority access licenses. And so there are incredible benefits to it, and I think it's something that we need to um, articulate and explain um, and make sure that folks um, understand. Thank you. Um, I know I went a little off script on my questions there, but uh, it raised an interesting thought for me. 
I also want to talk a little bit about the landscape between the inter the interagency issues that we have today. I know Meredith Baker touched on it. Uh, the, the first panel touched on it. I think um, Jessica Rosenworcel did as well. And you know, is there? And we have this unique opportunity to have somebody from NTIA and SCAC, even though you're talking in your personal capacity, um, to kind of discuss this particular issue. And so, are there things? that can be done to smooth out the interagency process beyond simply updating the memorandum of understanding? Are there, are there avenues here that haven't been explored yet? So thank you for the question. And uh, by you, you know, your point of the MOU, I, I think, um, and I'm sure Matthew would, would, would agree with this, one of the things that um, the Assistant Secretary, uh, Alan Davidson, and the Chairwoman right away talked about was improving coordination uh, for starters between the MCC and the NTIA and we talked about you know there's been a lot of uh, you know certainly coverage around some things over the last few years and uh, you know they announced the spectrum coordination initiative and I think we've gotten that ball rolling really well and then you know that includes a number of things including most importantly them meeting regularly and having conversations and um, you know I think over the years it's sometimes that's been the case between those two departments but not always and I think that's that's an important big step and then that flows down to the staff and the staff then meets regularly so I think those are those are key points and then as you mentioned sort of reaffirm reaffirming and reviewing the MOU and how we could you know make some targeted improvements there to help facilitate that process um, and then I think a key piece is, is sort of a recommitment to you know evidence-based decision making and scientific analysis and, and that's you know that's easier said than done right because lots of times you end up with you know a study from one party a study from another and they're technically all you know science or data based and you have to make some determination so it's not easy but i think we need to build on that and we're looking looking to do that i think we're trying to produce some some tangible work work products in the coming year that i think will will, will help along those lines um, and then uh you know again we're also looking to increase our engagement with with external stakeholders too right both through you know obviously individual meetings and groups and and, and 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 working better together collectively we have an observer you know at the FCC TAC now from NTA and NTA is going to the FCC is going to have an observer at the at the CSMAC when we get that launched in a few weeks so I think those are all important but I think to me the bigger point too is that there you are going to get these disputes these are very hard challenging issues um, and I think to me it's Part of it is trying to avoid these, but I think the bigger issue is how do you work through them quickly when they do emerge, right? So that's, and I think we'll talk a bit more about planning, but a big part of this too is, is that roadmap and planning up front so you have time to do the work. Uh, because again, if you're talking about spectrum issues and particularly if you're gonna involve federal spectrum, federal users, you need time to do the analysis and do the studies and you can't just react quickly when something is proposed. So, you know, a lot, a lot there I know to unpack, but. Yes, I, I think Derek gave a, a great answer, and I agree with everything. Um, on the evidence base, um, you know, our engineers are and, and will continue to work with each other on um, compatibility analysis, um, and I think that that's really critical. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if people would be surprised or not, but we, we agree with each other much more often than we disagree. Um, and um, when we disagree, it's actually, those are the really critical issues where you can achieve the best outcome by, by t talking it through and um, uh, finding a middle ground. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Honestly, there, there is a lot of coordination that goes on every day between the FCC and NTIA at the engineer level or at the, at the staff level, um, and that goes very well. But as you said, it's when it's a really big policy decision that's gonna impact certain operations, that's when it gets complicated, so to speak. Um, it, so I would echo uh, what Deb was saying. You really need to engage stakeholders as early as possible. We learned that lesson from the C-band. Um, you know, the current MOU gives 15 days for coordination between uh, on these matters, and it's been how long that the carriers have been working with the FAA and with, with the airlines um, and with the industry. Uh, you know, it really takes engagement early on and an understanding of who's going to be affected. And the big issue is it's all well and good if your engineering and science is pointing you to what should be. What happens is when the receivers actually don't meet that 
And so that's 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 been the big complication with legato, with the C band. I'm sure there are others. Um, so I really really like uh, Chairwoman Rosenworcel's um, idea to create some type of a spectrum relocation fund for those types of issues. Um, I, I think that would help a lot. Uh, you, you know, it, I think Ruth, it was or the, the earlier panel was talking about how you you need to be able to, pre to look into the future and have policies that allow evolution. But there are times when it is going to affect certain parties uh, because they built receivers assuming a certain environment and the environment changed. So I really like her idea there as well. Um, I think it's really important to have strong White House leadership backing NTIA um, because uh, you know it's it's not easy having to negotiate with the behemoth of DOD, who then gets backed by Congress through the Homeland Security Committee, um, when it's NTIA that is the final regulator. Uh, and so I really think that. NTIA has terrific people, FCC has terrific people, great engineers, industry keeps stealing them um, for that reason. <laughs> um, but it's really important to bolster and back NTIA's authority as the spectrum regulator for the federal agencies. And one thing I would point out, by the way, that Ruth was talking about this morning, almost every other country is actually a ministry, not an independent regulator. Uh, so that's that's part of the difference between uh, the FCC and the NTIA split. Not every country does that, but it's it's a lot of the countries. Um, finally, and I mentioned this in my testimony, whenever that was, two three weeks ago, um, I really uh, I feel it's important to talk about the the NTIA lab ITS. Um, it is such an important component of these discussions. And industry, if you are not utilizing ITS, you really need to think about it because they are the ones that are gonna be able to, to show um, and to test and to provide the reports that help Derek make decisions, um, and ultimately Alan Davidson, working with the FCC on, on the spectrum environment and how parties are gonna be affected by particular decisions. And with that in mind, I would once again make a plug for um, there to be an exception to the um, compensation rules for engineers. I think it's too important to have these engineers on staff, and it, it is true that it's very difficult to recruit a good RF engineer and to keep them because they are in such high demand elsewhere. Um, if I could just jump in on, on the point, I think, I think it's a good question in terms of the, the division of responsibilities, and uh, I'm not here to advocate one thing or another. I think you know that's up to Congress. I think some of the advantages of the current um, uh, way of doing things statutorily, um, the benefits of it aren't discussed enough. I mean, I think um, having an independent agency on the commercial side that is less susceptible to political pressure, I think is really critical. But then um, on the government side, you can't, that, that doesn't work because they need to be in the chain of command um, with the White House. Um, and I also, you know, if you were to compare us to other countries, I think Tom, Tom Peters did a, a pretty comprehensive comparison way back and we should probably update it. But um, I would, I, you know, I think we favorably compare to any other country in terms of re reallocating government spectrum. This has actually raised an interesting um, question that I want to pose to you about the relationship between the public development around technical studies and standards and those produced by private entities and how that how, how they are kind of used in tandem or not in tandem when it comes to making these policy making decisions. Is there is there a balance in that process today or does there need to be more balance in that process? I wonder if you all could talk a little bit about um, the relationship between the public and private when it comes to the development of these new technological studies around spectrum management. Um, I mean, I think that, um, you know, point that Derek made that's really critical is um, having both the government process, but also a lot of outreach 
um, including some, you know, we, we work with the commercial side all the time, but, but so does NTIA and the administration. Um, and so I think that can be really helpful in terms of having those conversations um, that avoid, uh, avoid having a crisis. Um, so that, that, that's probably an element that's really critical. And I think some folks on the non-federal side know that and, and others um, may be more helpful uh, for them to be aware of it. I think it's an interesting question. I, I would imagine the commission faces this a lot more with different studies being put in, the, in their records of their proceedings um, and then the federal side as well. But I, I do think we try to certainly look at both. Um, I think you may see some of that feed too into the international processes too, where there's a lot of study work done um, by both sides. But I think it's a good point. I, I think to me, the, the more the more studies and uh, analysis that's out there, the better. Uh, again, it puts it puts an onus on the on the on the government to to look at these and analyze them. Uh, and I think it's also the interesting question too on how much is it organically started by the government in terms of the agencies and NTIA and then how much comes from the outside. So it's kind of a mix. I don't know there's a there's a great answer, but I think it's important to keep them all in, 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 uh, in consideration. Yeah. Um, this is great. I get to kind of ask my, the questions that I've been wanting to ask for a while from some really phenomenal uh, thought leaders in this space, so thank you. Um, but the I want to bring it back to the Spectrum Task Force uh, report for a second. So the Spectrum Task Force report, um, it divided its recommendations into kind of three big categories, uh, interference avoidance, spectrum rights models, and promoting access to spectrum. Are these three categories still relevant today? Uh, and are there any additional buckets that we should be considering as we're thinking about spectrum policy into the next 20 years? So I think those categories are really useful for conceptualizing things. Um, one of them, that there's, it's mentioned in the task force report, I noticed, but I, I don't think that it's talked about enough, is we need to talk about how spectrum access has both rights and responsibilities. Um, and I think that we focus on, in that bucket, we focus on the rights side of things, um, and perhaps less frequently on responsibilities to you know, transmit and receive only within the frequencies that the FCC or NTIA is authorized in terms of um, using the spectrum efficiently. Um, and in terms of, um, in, in some of these relocations that incumbents have the right to be held harmless. Um, you know, if they need to relocate or use less spectrum that, you know, those should be funded by new entrants. Um, but that um, ultimately it's, it's the federal government um, under the Communications Act that, that owns the spectrum and, and needs to manage it efficiently in the, in the public interest and make sure that all the parties um, honor those responsibilities. Yeah, I think I agree with everything there. Um, I think they are the probably the right categories and partly because they're so broad, right? I mean, so if we talk about, I mean, if we talk about, for example, promoting access to spectrum, I mean, a lot falls under that, right? Um, I, you know, I think, I think in the last 20 years, even more emphasis on spectrum sharing has been a big part of it. And uh, um, so I, I think, that, I think they're right. I think, uh, I, I think from a priority perspective, these are the, the things we continue to look at. Uh, it's, it's fascinating. We often joke around these spectrum policy issues there. Nothing's really seems new. They just sort of evolved. Um, we have those conversations a lot. I should have mentioned this up front, but Trying to channel Peter Tenhu a little bit, so a lot of folks know Peter, who was one you know, co-director of the uh, of, of the task force report, and then you know spent over a decade at NTIA, and actually we have him back then part time yeah. helping us out. But um, I think Peter brought a lot of those concepts into his work at NTIA, and we've tried to filter that through, and I think a lot of our our policy thinking as well, and a lot of these ideas. And sometimes you feel like you're banging your head against the wall a little bit on some of these. Um, but you know, we've been talking more lately about these issues, not necessarily the noise floor proposal here, but just again measuring the environment. You know, thinking about we're going to work with ITs. How, how do we measure the environment out there, and what's really happening and happening in, in the in the field to then bring that back to this coexistence questions? Because we just keep packing more and more users into not just the same bands but adjacent bands, and and 
in mixing services too, I think what was interesting in the report, they talked about this idea of spectrum neighborhoods and you know, do you kind of go back to that? We kind of drifted apart from that a little bit, partly because we had this sort of piecemeal whack-a-mole approach of we need to find a van, let's put it there, let's put it there. So the spectrum neighbors issue, I think is, is something to think about too when we, when we talk about long-term planning. Um, you know, it certainly would be a lot simpler if you could group like services near each other, but we're, we're finding actually, I think it's becoming more, more of a Swiss cheese out there, which is creating this issue for this kind of, these coexistence and neighbors and, and the like. I think the one thing I would add is equity. I know you were gonna raise that later, but uh, I would want that to also be a bucket that's considered in the future. Why don't we actually just jump down to that and then we'll jump back up to the other questions. And um, so, so Harold very poignantly brought up the issue of equity and, uh, you know, in the Spectrum Task Force report, there was this kind of assumption that equity, you know, wasn't an issue that related or needed to be addressed in Spectrum policy. But I think the, the thoughts around that have shifted. Um, and I'm wondering if there, if what role can Spectrum policymakers play in addressing these issues of equity and social justice uh, when it comes to looking at spectrum policy of the next 20 years. Well, I'm so glad you raised that. Uh, <laughs> um, I, one thing that the Biden administration has done very well, and they did that starting with the campaign, is they have been very intentional about um, considering the equity impact of their policies, um, but it has to continue. Um, and and I, I would say also, I've noticed the FCC has started to add questions about uh, impact on equity of some of their decisions. Um, and you know, the, the questions need to be both, you know, how would this decision impact equity and social justice, but also how can it promote equity and social justice, not just how does it impact it. Um, and if we keep that filter in mind, then I think then, then we can continue to, to make progress. I don't, I don't have the magic answer right now, but one other thing that Harold raised earlier that I thought was interesting was he asked, you know, um, what other experts should we have in a future task force that looks at spectrum policy? And it, it made me think, you know, we should have somebody who's an expert on equity and social justice. Um, I, I think in particular about someone who wasn't gonna be on this panel uh, Dr. Lisa Valentin, but who couldn't make it because she's traveling, um, who's at the National Urban League, she has been talking about this now for a while, and she has very good thoughts on it. Um, so I would hope that any future task force actually includes somebody like her. Um, there are things, obviously, you know, the National Urban League has talked about ways to promote equity um, through use of spectrum funds and things like that, but I think we can continue to think about these issues by being very intentional about it. Um, so I agree with everything Hannah said. Ch Chairwoman Rosenworcel has been, been very clear and um, has been banging that drum that, that spectrum policy is, is critical to equity. Um, I, you know, one thing I would mention is I think that we, and when I say we, I'm talking about like all the spectrum policy wonks in the room, need to be better about explaining it to the public and having, I think there's some understanding that things like USF and broadband subsidies are important to equity. And there's less of an understanding of spectrum policy, which is this, you know, more diff, you know, more sort of conceptually dif difficult area that folks don't necessarily think about. So, uh, you know, I think if you if you look back at like the 1970s and the Nita rights, you, you used to have like all kinds of, you know, members of the public that were, you know, sort of very active at the FCC. And we still have that to some extent, but I think we need to do a better job of communicating on spectrum policy in order to encourage that participation. Just want to echo those comments. Um, you know, I will refer, and I know it's been mentioned again today, the need for the national spectrum strategy, and I think you're going to see more more development on that way. And the assistant secretary and the chairwoman have have publicly, you know, committed to, to working together on that. Um, and, and I would just invite folks to to bring these type of issues to the table in that process because there will be there will be public outreach. Yeah, another and important aspect of the equity issue is 
specifically thinking about tribal access to spectrum, uh, there was a recent study that came out, I think this past week, in telecommunications policy about the broadband access and uh, access you know, to services on tribal lands. And it was kind of shocking that 66%, uh, I think, of folks on tribal lands have access to the internet compared to 87% of the surrounding non-tribal areas. Uh, they have 75% slower speeds, and they also pay 11% more. So there's some serious concerns around that. And I know like with the 2.5 auction, there was the tribal windows that was open early. Was that an effective tool to trying to begin addressing some of these issues? And are there um, any other tools or ways to try to expand on that you know, model or other ways of trying to ensure that tribal um, you know, leaders can secure access to the spectrum on their native lands? Um, so, so I think that this is a multifaceted problem, and so it requires a multifaceted solution. I think on the rural um, tribal priority window, I think we're, we're very proud of the work we did in collaboration with the, with the tribes. Um, we granted 335 licenses to, that will, um, to tribal entities that affect 350 tribes in 30 states. Um, and we're already seeing build out on that, um, providing service. Um, but um, but that, that's only one solution, and so I think that we need to look at things like CPRS that provides opportunities um, both in terms of PALS and GIA, and um, when you look at tribal sovereignty and sort of controlling the, the land, then you could leverage some of that. There's unlicensed spectrum, um, but I think we're open to ideas and proposals, so um, it's an issue that Chairwoman Rosenworcel cares deeply about, and. I would encourage folks, if they have ideas, definitely um, come talk to us. Uh, I agree with Matt, of course. Uh, um, a couple other things. Uh, it, I do think that it's a good idea to have tribal windows for um, auctions that have uh, for spectrum over tribal lands. Um, you know, the commission can also consider other incentives like bidding credits. Uh, for participants who commit to providing service in tribal lands or some kind of market incentives for auction uh, winners to enter into secondary tra uh, market transactions for service to tribal lands. Um, one thing NTIA does very well, and I'm not saying the FCC doesn't because I actually don't know, um, is it does uh, technical assistance really well. Um, and you see this a lot in the, in the tribal grants process. Um, and so I think that uh, having uh, a lot more technical assistance uh, or, or technical assistance for tribal participants um, can be very helpful uh, because we did see some hiccups, particularly due to COVID, during the uh, 2.5 auction. Um, and and uh, I think that um, providing resources to the tribes will also help. Okay. I'm going to jump back up to what was question five. Um, so the prayer panel talked about a lot of issues that are still relevant today. Uh, receivers being a big one. I mean, the, the uh, comments are due next week. If you're ready, let's get on it. Um, <laughs> Uh, rural deployment, technical issues, and what does the persistence of these issues over the course of 20 years, and you know, honestly, even before 20 years ago, uh, say about the, you know, the, the recommendations of the Spectrum Task Force report, and also the ability to, to address these issues through policy? Go ahead and start here. I think, uh, and yeah, great discussion on the last panel. I, I think, um, I think what it says about the recommendations was that that they were they were pretty spot on, but they also identified a lot of persistent challenges uh, that remain relevant today. I don't think it means we haven't made progress on a lot of them. Though. I think we talked a lot about how how much has changed. Um, you know, I think in terms of 
more recent develops, developments. And I mentioned this earlier, I think, I think sort of, uh, you know, I, I kind of view we're at a time of spectrum sharing where I think we need like this fundamental change to the more dynamic model. And I think CBRS was, was a fantastic um, leap into that. But I think, I think there's more we can do. And on the, uh, on the NTIA side, we spent a lot of time thinking and preparing for something we're sort of informally calling, you know, an informant incumbent capability or IIC, you know, to the point where there's actually legislation that's been introduced in Congress now in support to look on how we build on that. Um, and part of the thing about IIC, by the way, was looking at CBRS with the sharing model and the sensors in the field and how that worked. And we thought, you know, there's, that's worked pretty well, but there's some, there's some problems with the system there, um, including like, for example, having to protect those, those actual sensors now, which can interfere with the actual spectrum that you're trying to deploy, right? So some things like that, how do, how do, we, how do we first you know, make that a better model so you can, you can protect incumbents, but you can get that information into the system, whether it's out to, to the SAS or other type of you know, directly to licensees, whatever, right? How, how do, you, how do you, um, you know, improve that process and how do you start and how do you ultimately automate it? Um, so we're, I think, really looking for how we make a paradigm shift there. Uh, I think it means too. There's there's a lot of sort of sacred cows out there that need to be looked at. I think you know, as much as we talk about the Department of Defense and their spectrum use, they're actually being pretty forward leaning in a lot of the work they're doing now, a lot of the studying they're doing, a lot of the, the tests they're running in partnership with industry on on how they could, you know, increase dynamic spectrum sharing. And, and part of this is because they know the pressure to decrease their spectrum footprint, but also they need to operate in these bands as increasingly, you know, the, the conflict environment for them is based on spectrum-based technology. So they're, they're sort of looking at that, they're looking at 5G use cases. So I, I think if we really think long-term, figuring out how to dynamically share spectrum, uh, you know, and, and again, I know it's, it's probably gonna be more pilots, it's not gonna be across the board, but I think if we're honest, I think we need to have some people open to some new ideas on exploring some of these areas. Uh, and, and I will say, by the way, that FCC and NCAA do need to be in the driver's seat on this, so I'm not, I'm not, you know, not, uh, not disputing any of that. But I think these are new areas we need to really think about and look at. So I think, the, again, the report remains relevant, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's fun to think about the changes. So I guess I would group the issues you mentioned into two buckets. I think there are the issues that we've made progress in part because of the recommendations um, of the task force, but you know, on, on, <laughs> on, um, you know, on broadband, the chairwoman has been very clear that like that's an issue that we must solve, that we need to have a 100% policy, meaning that everyone has access to broadband. Um, I think receiver standards are, are another one where um, we need to make sustainable sort of pro long-term progress, you know, um, soon, and, and hopefully we will. Um, we're getting a record in, in response to the receiver's NOI. Um, and, and then there are the issues that are just always going to be perennial, um, particularly technical issues, um, technology, use cases, um, standards, they're all gonna always evolve. And so we need to constantly assess them and be very nimble, while at the same time honoring the sort of the, the, the time-honored principles, you know, things like flexibility to all users, um, you know, making sure that folks are actually using the spectrum through build-out um, and uh, technology neutrality um, as well. But the, those are always going to change, and we're we're never going to solve them permanently. The only thing I would add uh, to what uh, Derek and Matt said is. Um, Part of the reason DOD is able to be so active and so forward thinking and to work on all these test bases is because they have a lot of money to do it. NCIA does not. Um, and I, I, you know, we've been talking about the incumbent informing capability for a while, but unless Congress funds it, it's not going to happen. NCIA systems really badly need to be upgraded. Um, I hope I'm not saying something I shouldn't be saying. Um, but it makes it very difficult to continue to try to be. Um, quick and rapid in decision making if NTI does not have the tools that it needs. So I can say this because I'm a private sector person, uh, but that would be my plug. I want to go back to something um, that Derek talked about a little bit about the, the need for looking at new um, sharing and access technology. and. You know, the previous panel, there were some mentions of some legacy 
see technologies that didn't take off. And I'm curious if this might be a time for Back to the Future, um, where some technologies that were discussed 20 years ago, even though they didn't take off, they might actually have just been ahead of their time. So are there, due to the advancements in technology and the changes in kind of the technical landscape around spectrum policy, are there any, um, you know, technologies or thoughts that are worth kind of re-exploring? And I'm sorry, I know this was not on the question. It, um, it, it is just one that uh, kind of popped into my head while we were having this discussion. So if you don't have an answer, you don't have an answer, but. Yeah, no, I, I think I think there probably are. Um, I, I think, again, sometimes it's evolution of technologies. I mean, the, we talked about sensing good things that are, that are getting better. I think one that's, we're seeing more of is, is ultra wide bands. So that's, you know, kind of making the, a bit of a comeback. And I think, uh, you know, a, 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 a challenge getting our arms around that a little bit. Um, so I, I think I think there, there are, and then as I mentioned, a lot of this spectrum sharing technologies are, are, are getting better. I think we just have to, you know, have to use them. And then overall technology gets better, right? So the spectrum's being used more efficiently. Obviously the commercial side deploys those quicker. There are, believe it or not, there are innovations that do happen in federal spectrum use. The problem is sometimes those roadmaps and those technologies are, they take a lot longer, you know, to, to get out there in the field. Uh, the life cycle for a lot of government technology systems is really long. Um, so one I've mentioned is artificial intelligence, which is one of those technologies that always seems like it's five or 10 years away. Um, but, but that's one that I think is being incorporated into the standards in 3GBP and elsewhere. Um, and it's gonna really, we're, we're gonna have to think sort of radically about how that affects regulation um, and, and to be nimble so that we can accommodate. Um, you know, I mean, we're gonna need a lot more experts to go back to what um, Anna was saying on things like that. Um, when it comes to, you know, this access to spectrum, there, there's always the talk about the spectrum pipeline. It's always the hot topic. It was the hot topic 20 years ago. It's a hot topic today. Um, is this always going to be a hot topic? And if the answer is yes, which I suspect it is, um, are there sustainable long-term solutions so that it's not something that we need to like emergency look at every 10 years or every, like is there a way to come up with some kind of sustainable long-term solution for providing that continued um, spectrum pipeline? I suspect that this is what's gonna be in the national spectrum strategy that uh, Derek and Matt are probably gonna talk about the answer, right? I think one of the things we talk about spectrum pipeline can mean a lot of different things to different people, right? So when we talk about a pipeline, certainly part of this is is um, you know what's what's coming for say FCC auctions or what's coming for uh, maybe unlicensed environment. And I think what we're trying to think on the federal side too is what's the, what's the federal roadmap, and some of that will be involving spectrum usage. Um, I, I think this long-term planning, it would, it would be really nice to get out of more of the, the whack-a-mole approach I think we do take with spectrum bands. Some of that's inevitable. Things change, right? I mean, if you think about the millimeter wave stuff, that was, couldn't have planned that 10 years before because technology changed and it became easier to utilize. And then, you know, the industry shifted to, to mid-band. So a lot of those things are, are out there. Um, but to Anna's point on resources, I think it's important because, you know, we can focus our priorities. Right. We've talked a lot, like right now, we've been very focused on harvesting the mid-band for, for Spectrum. And we talk about lower three gigahertz and we're really optimistic, but that's gonna take a lot of work for the next you know, year or two. And um, gosh, in a perfect scenario, if we, for, if we can get act, commercial access to that band, you know, then we go from 3.1 all the way up to 3.9 gigahertz. And that's a lot of mid-band Spectrum that a decade ago, if you told people that was coming, they would have said, yeah, right. So, I mean, I think, you know, I, I think the long-term planning is really important, um, and I, I think trying to identify where that where that next focus may be is important. And I know the chairwoman's talked about seven to sixteen gigahertz. I think I think that's part of our thinking now is to figure out where we put those resources, and not just now, but for ten years, fifteen years. And again, it doesn't 
The problem with us sometimes is we have again a limited number of engineers, and if, if we're working on lower three, and then we're told go look at, and then somebody throws four gigahertz at you, it, it it's not always helpful because again that sets back lots of times in the process. And so I understand you know the industry is going to sort of throw everything against the wall and see what sticks, but the problem is that process has a lot of implications on the government side, right? In terms of again only so many resources we can we can put at looking at. Um, so, so again, I know we people get afraid of sort of the industrial policy, you know, label that other countries do. But I think I, I would like to see a shift more to thinking. And again, as I mentioned before, federal systems have very long life cycles. If we knew in 2035, you know, where, you know, like again, we could get point agencies to work planning for spectrum use for this area or how they might, you know, longer term planning like that is really hard. But I think if we're really serious about changing some things, that's what we have to do, or we'll just continue to be in the sort of, you know, again, whack-a-mole approach. Um, so, so I think the answer to the question is yes. I, I think this is a perennial thing we'll have to work on, partly because there's always new demand. Um, also, I think in, in a point, a point that economists would make is that spectrum is different from natural resources and that you can never exhaust it. Um, you can always use it more intensively and efficiently. Um, and, and I think, I completely agree with Derek on long range planning. I think understanding where spectrum is being used, the density of use, and then um, trying to find long term solutions is really helpful. I think um, technology creates the, the problem in the sense that it creates fresh demand, but it also sometimes creates the solutions um, as well as incentives. Um, and I think it's a it's a balance because you need the long range planning and that's really important, but you need to bring those creative in solutions, whether it's technology and coordination and sharing, or um, or incentives um, to each individual sort of area of the spectrum because you oftentimes do have different situations. So we need that long term vision, but then we need to bring a lot of creativity to each situation. And if I could just add. Um it, it's that much more difficult in the international arena. We talked about the World Radio Communication Conference. Uh, and the need to forward plan for that is so much even longer than you're than the dealing with the day to day whack a mole approach. You know, kind of along with those those lines of the need for this you know, ongoing spectrum pipeline. Part of the decision making around where to get spectrum, like what bands to try to look at, what bands to open up, requires access to you know accurate, complete, timely data. Um, are there da data points that policymakers don't have access to or struggle to get access to um, that they need in order to be making these decisions? And if the answer to that is yes. What are some of those, what, what is that data that's missing? And then what are some of those barriers that are preventing policymakers from getting access to the data they need? Um, so, so one of the areas we've been focused on is broadband maps, because I think those are critical to informing a lot of different policies, and it includes spectrum policy. Um, so that's why we're doing the broadband data collection um, to fill that gap. Um, and um, to get really accurate, accurate, comprehensive nationwide um, data that's very granular. Um, and so on the mobile side, it's gonna be the first time that we're collecting in a standardized format the mobile data. Um, and um, there's gonna be, in terms of verifying it, it's gonna be an iterative process. Um, and there's both an internal and an external component to that. The internal is that we get the data biannually the public, um, organizations, you know, any, anyone can file a challenge and we'll look at it. Um, and then internally, we're, we also have some mechanisms that we're gonna use to verify it. Um, but I think that'll be, that'll be very helpful. Um, and more data is, is certainly helpful, but it's always a challenge because so, sometimes though, when you're doing a transition, it's, it's hard to know ahead of time, um, unless you're in the midst of it, exactly what you need. So I, I, you know, I lived C-band during the rulemaking for several years, and that's an area where um, we had some data, but it's just this whole complex ecosystem involving satellites, earth stations, you know, fixed legacy, you know, we, we had all kinds of incumbents. Um, and so it's a very complex area where 
some of the data we need, um, you know, long term and to figure that out now. And, and sometimes we need to be nimble and figure out exactly what we need for a, for a particular proceeding. Agree, access to data is always um, good and certainly in, ideal, in an ideal world we'd have access to, to more of it and it would be accurate. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, what are, what are barriers? I, I think on the, on the there's, there's spectrum usage data, I think is important to policymakers and, and we talked about it a little bit. I think some, some spectrum monitoring, going back to ICTS, I think we're, we're thinking through some of that, including maybe like some, some CBRS type stuff monitoring, how it's being used out there and what, what those implications might be. And then I just think back, you know, a lot of this is in the FCC and TI coordination on sharing data, both, you know, sort of obviously from the, the federal side and what information we can provide, some of that, you know, publicly, some of it not. Um, and, and then I think vice versa on getting characteristics from, from industry usage, right? And we've seen that play out in some different areas. And, and that stuff can help help inform the, uh, the spectrum studies that, that we do and that the federal agencies do both, you know, domestically and then in, in, the, in the international processes work too, where there's a lot of technical studies that get done. The issue of access to good usage data to me is interesting because it's a bit of a, of a, a conflict with market-based mechanisms for spectrum management, right? Because you shouldn't need to have that usage data, but then all of a sudden you start thinking about repurposing spectrum. And it's very difficult to make a decision about repurposing spectrum if you don't know exactly how that spectrum is being utilized, even though it's subject to market incentives. If you go back to sort of more command and control -y, so it's back to our, our discussion of the, the original Spectrum Policy Task Force report um, uh, in the last panel. I, I think that it, access to good usage data can be difficult. Um, it comes up more when decisions are being made, like in the C-band, where you know the FCC had to go through a lot of iterations of who's using this, where are they, you know, how much is it going to cost um, to move them. Um, it's also a challenge with classified systems. This is particularly challenging to industry when they are looking at uh, asking for licenses and spectrum bands but not understanding exactly how it's gonna impact federal users. Um, and I don't have an answer to how to fix that because it's a need to know basis uh, and, and it's, it's, it's a difficult thing when you see, well, it's, it's being used um, by DOD but you don't understand what it's being, exactly what it's being used for and how they'll be impacted without actually having that conversation with them. With, with them. Um, so I'm not giving an answer. I'm just saying it's an interesting challenge um, and we're gonna see it come up more and more and more as we start trying to uh, fit more and more users within spectrum bands. I wonder if I wonder then if the um, if there's an opportunity instead of focusing on specific types of data that need to be you know collected on a regular basis to instead work on crafting a procedure that you know the FCC can request data as they need it in a way that you know will be secure enough for for um, carriers to feel comfortable or users of Spectrum, Spectrum licensees and unlicensed, et cetera, wh whoever the stakeholders are that you need to get data from. Um, and, you know, I know that there are some processes already, but are there any barriers within that process that or opportunities to kind of improve that process to, to focus on that as opposed to thinking about, oh, this is the type of data that we need since, um, since it is so, specific to the proceeding. Um, yeah, I think that that's a very interesting and tough question. Um, I, I mean, I think um, th there are requirements and I'm not, not commenting on the merits of them sometimes, but as a legal matter, we can always ask licensees for information about how they're using spectrum. I mean, as a statutory matter, um, there are requirements when we're doing information collection um, that require um, notice and um, some time for them to respond and, and things like that procedurally. Um, but, um, but I think you know it's an interesting and, and tough challenge and, and we're certainly um, open to any ideas that, that folks have. Before I ask um, 
uh, what, what is my last question? I'd like to open it up to the audience. Does anybody have any questions for our panelists today? Carol. Yeah, um, of course I've got questions. <laughs> this is too good a panel to pass up on. For, for a, I'd like to actually get to one point you were just talking about with regard to the information. As somebody who is a consumer of the commission information, um, I've encountered the following problems. First, the commission, when it wants to create, when it wants to collect information, although as Matt said, it has authority, runs into a large number of procedural blocks that have been put in there by Congress that are applicable to all agencies. So, you know, the uh, uh, the, the various uh, things that need to be approved by OMB and OIRA, um, which make collecting and maintaining these data more difficult when you need it. Uh, the other is the commission's um, databases that it maintains now are, I will try to be polite about this, um, somewhat confusing and do not coordinate well with each other. Um, asking you guys, uh, what do you think you know, should, if the FCC were to try to do something about this, where do you think it ought to be putting its resources? And this is a kind of ask Congress question, you know, or NPIA alternatively, um, for the information that it needs, needs. Should there be exceptions to the existing uh, um, Paperwork Reduction Act and other uh, uh, statutes for information that the FCC needs? Should Congress allocate money explicitly to uh, um, simplify and uh, uh, ban it for the FCC for right, its license and database management in a way similar to the, that it had, that it allocates money for mapping. Um, what did, or is it just a yeah FCC or even NPIA? We got to be better about just you know standing up to licensees and telling them we want this information. What do you think uh, um, you know would be the the biggest help uh, to uh, the agencies in terms of gathering necessary information. Um, so, so, so I'm going to refrain from you know specifically advocating what Congress should do. I, I do think that on all those issues, it's really important to um, clearly articulate the pros and cons. So, when you're talking about things like um, the procedural requirements that that might require six months or a year before you can actually get the information. Um, just having an understanding of like what are the economic um, disadvantages of that when it delays making spectrum available. So I, I just think for all those issues that we need to um, articulate and, and, and give the decision makers the information they need to weigh the costs and, and benefits. Really have much much more on that arrow to be honest I think um, I think those, those those are constraints but I think trying to find ways around you know getting as much information as possible of course is good not to be a broken record but getting the funding necessary to be able to have the staffing uh, would be a concern any other questions one question. Uh, spectrum policy has historically been apolitical, but we live in a political time and there's a lot of controversy on a lot of different issues. How do you see the current political environment and any changes that might happen in November changing spectrum policy or affecting it? And we have seen, say, for example, Mike O'Reilly advocate withdrawing from the ITU and creating a G7 organization. Uh, is that a is that a Republican policy? Is that a, you know, what are some policies that might be associated with one party or another, and how do they play out? I'm assuming Derek and Matt don't want to touch that. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I think that alarm going off is a don't answer. <laughs> you know, that's a really good question. And you're right, spectrum policy has largely been apolitical. I think what you see more is tension between committees. 
than and what their missions are, right? Because everybody wants to wants to push their mission, um, and and but but you see a change in Congress on the spectrum side. Um, I have to, I, I I have a hard time really saying what I see as a significant difference uh, on spectrum policy. We might see it in other policies. Um, but, but on spectrum policies, I'm, I'm not sure if you would see a significant shift. Um, I do think you will see very aggressive oversight, mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean it'll be for different outcomes. Anyone else? I'm gonna take the last question then. Um, what is the number one issue, in your opinion, that is facing spectrum policymakers today? And how do you hope that issue is going to be addressed over the next 20 years? Okay, I'll go first. I think I've already mentioned that to me, the number one issue is this, is this need for long, longer term planning. You know, and, and I don't always use, want to use the word roadmap, but I really think you know, figuring that out, I think is number one. And I think the second one, I'm, I'm gonna cheat here a little bit, because I think the second one is truly really embracing this dynamic spectrum sharing. I think we need to do that more. But I was also gonna take the opportunity to comment a little bit. I, I wrote, I jotted down from, from Chairwoman Rosen Russell's comments, and I thought it was fascinating when she went through her list of five things that, and I listed to Alan Davidson, that there's a lot of commonality. Um, you know, she mentioned the near term, you know, lower three gigahertz, it's significant updating the CSEA, which I didn't talk about much, but the SRF, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hugely important, and I think I think we're all aligned behind trying to get some more flexibility there. Um, you know, exploring receivers, you know, the commission's doing, and I think on, on the NTIA side, we've looked at the federal side, and, and uh, you know, been to put some information on the record, that there actually is a lot of receiver standards in our in the NTIA Red Book, as you call it, and some, some work done there, but so further advancing on, on receivers. You know, consider the broader use of, of, uh, of incentives. That's something that's been out there forever. I've been talking about on the federal side, but I also think um, on the non-federal side, there's there's work that can be done there. And then, uh, you know, using, she mentioned the, the opportunity with Spectrum Auction Authority and funding national priorities. And that's something, again, this is personal. I've always thought we've had this lost opportunity on spectrum, on spectrum revenues of putting more back into the spectrum management ecosystem and we've talked about IIC we've got NTIs going through an IT modernization people would not believe how old the systems are that NTI relies on to authorize federal frequency assignments um, you know and it's it's hard to get the appropriations for that um, so I think you know putting money into into maybe R&D on spectrum sharing out of these auctions I know there's Congress you know like loves you know deficit reduction but I think there's a lot of uh, spectrum priorities there too um, so I'm gonna refrain from answering for really because uh, the chairwoman sort of already already laid it out from the FCC perspective. Um, just to focus in on one in terms of the SRF, um, you know, there are a number of changes that she's mentioned. Um, one that I, I hope you know that folks understand is the requirement that each auction needs to, to fund 110% of the relocation expenses for that specific transition. Um, and that, that you know, can in some ways be a barrier to making spectrum available for unlicensed, for hybrid use, as well as um, just finding sort of creative solutions that over the course of a number of auctions might fund um, those relocations, but for that particular individual auction um, might not meet the 110% requirement. Um, and, um, and one of the issues that, um, that hasn't been mentioned um, and wasn't really a focus of the task force in 2002, but is um, network and cybersecurity, um, which also has a spectrum component. Um, we're implementing the, the Secure and Trusted Communications Act, known as Rip and Replace Program. Um, that's really important so that we can have trusted networks. Um, and we're also, the commission's also looking at um, other ways to make networks more secure, things like the equipment authorization process, um, but we're open to other ideas. Um, and, and we need a whole of government approach on that, which is the reason that um, the chairwoman relaunched um, the cybersecurity forum for independent and executive branch uh, regulators. Um, but it, it's also, as the chairwoman has said, it's a, it's a problem for everyone. So uh, we need the private sector 
um, as well as the public to, to also participate in that. I think the number one issue facing uh, drive from policymakers today is the need to respect and bolster the NTIA and FCC's roles as spectrum regulators. Um, the other, other thing I would add, and Chairwoman Rosen Rosal, who raised this before, I don't recall if she raised it today, is the need to um, value non auction spectrum for purposes of, of uh, scoring. Um, I think it's, it's uh, you discount the benefits to the economy from non-auction, from unlicensed uses and other downstream uses um, that don't get the benefit of the CBO score and therefore not necessarily uh, become a part of the um, uh, any spectrum authorization. We have not talked about, oh my God, I think the number one issue today is we need to get the spectrum options reauthorized. Uh, <laughs> and then let's worry about everything else. Um, well, that's that's all I had for today. Thank you. Yeah. So, thank you all. Everybody, give them a round of applause. Um, that was an amazing discussion.